thank you for, for coming to our presentation. This is a bit of a, a last of organization uh, to, to get uh, Jay here. And before Jay starts his talk, I just want to introduce him and uh, give you a little context about uh, Jay's talk today. So Jay is a very remarkable guy, and he's uh, remarkable on a number of levels. He has uh, accomplished a lot of impressive athletic feats, and impressive academic feats, and has overcome a lot in his life, and has sort of uh, uh, starting off as a victim of bullying in school, and uh, his perseverance, uh, perhaps is one of his most impressive characteristics, has taken him to, to uh, uh, two degrees, uh, diploma, and, and as well as the athletic feats that he's accomplished. He's going to share with you. I don't want to give it away because it's pretty impressive what he's done. So let's give him a, a warm connect welcome. And this is Jim. Okay, thank you. Okay, my name is Jay Sergula. I, I have Asperger's syndrome. Okay, here's my line with the presentation. First, I'm going to quickly mention my university education. I'm going to talk to you about my spread across Lake Ontario, my life with Asperger's syndrome, and then I'm going to talk about my experiences in school, both from a social perspective and from an academic perspective. Now, I did my undergraduate degree in applied math at the University of Waterloo. My parents were my parents knew from an early age that there was something different about me. They tried to get me diagnosed when I was five or six, but each doctor said something different, and eventually my parents gave up. I was finally diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome at the age of 26, which meant I had completed grade school, high school, and university without any special education. It wasn't until my final year of university that I had even heard the term Asperger's syndrome. And, and there was no diagnosis for Asperger's syndrome until 1994. So that explains why my parents were unsuccessful at getting me a diagnosis at a young age. Yeah, so I recently for 10 years ago, I swam across Lake Ontario. This is supposed to say Niagara on the Lake, but it's got truncated. So I swam from Niagara on the Lake to Toronto. And it's 50 kilometers. And, and, and I did it to raise awareness for Asperger's syndrome, but more importantly, to demonstrate what people with Asperger's syndrome can do when they put their minds to it. So here's the website, but I know you're not able to copy it down. So ask your teacher afterwards for the website. I'm sure they'll be happy to give it to you. Now, what inspired me to swim across Lake Ontario? And now for some time, I've been on the lookout for, this, for challenges, especially challenges involving physical activity. And a 15-year-old girl by the name of Jenna Lambert she swam across Lake Ontario, and she has cerebral palsy. Cerebral means of the brain, so uh, difficulty with motor coordination. So she was unable to walk without crutches or a walker because she had limited use of her legs. So because you're not allowed to touch a bone or use any flotation, so the hardest part of the crossing was the feeding times when she had to eat with one hand and tread water with the other hand. I was so inspired by her crossing that I thought I wanted to work to it. And Asperger's syndrome was the charity of my choice because it has personal significance for me. So there's a picture of me doing one of my many training swims with downtown Kingston in the background. There's a picture of my parents, my sister, and me taking the morning of the crossing. We're all wearing our Asperger's shirts for support. In order to swim across the Lake Ontario, I, what items would I need? Any suggestions? Yes? Well, more, 
Well, that's something you, you, you need whenever you go swimming, but to swim across a great lake, what, what would I need? Well, yes. Well, yes, I definitely need food because, yes? Well, conditioning, but that's part of the training. Yes? Do you need water? Like water you do? Yeah, well, that's, that, 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 that falls in the food category. Yes? Do you need to have a good and push? good strive and push. That's, yeah, yeah, that's necessary as well, but that's, again, part of the training. Yes, but that's what I was looking for, is the support goal. Is there's an organization called, I'm not saying all your answers were correct, but just there's a given answer that I was looking for, but it's sometimes it's difficult. As I'll mention later, I, the teacher asks a question on the test, and I may give an answer that's correct, but it's not the answer that's, that the teacher is looking for at that time. So there's an organization called the Solo Swords of Ontario, or abbreviated SSO. They oversee the crossing of all Great Lakes, so they have a long checklist. Of the first item on the list is two boats, at least 30 feet long. One is used as a lead boat to set the course. The other one's the evacuation boat, like in case there's thunder or lightning or a medical emergency. I was lucky enough to connect with Carrie's Place Autism Services. Like, they wanted this swim to happen because it would help raise awareness. So they paid for the boat rentals and they helped with the organization. So the boats only needed to be 30 feet long. But this one of the boats was 68 feet. So judging by the comparison of sizes of the people and the boats, it gives you an idea of how big the boat was. So the next thing on the list is two 14-foot zodiacs. That's an inflatable boat like this one. So one zodiac must be beside a swimmer at all times. The other zodiac is used to transport crew members between boats. So how many of you are on the cross country running team? How many of you like to run? Now, when you run, do you think you'll run faster when you're by yourself? Or you, when you have someone else running beside you, pacing you. And you run faster when there's someone running with you. It motivates you to go faster. And then if, you, if, for, if for only a second you think, oh, I don't want to keep this up and you slow down, then the fact that someone's running beside you helps make you want to run faster. Same thing with swimming. So Ian and Karen were two of the crew members. They were the designated pacers. They took turns swimming beside me. Now, a kayak is not required, but it's highly desired because I'm not allowed to touch a boat or use any flotation, but I'm allowed to have people hand me food and water. As you can see, there's a Tupperware dish strapped to the back of the kayak with some snacks in it, and a lot of water bottles strapped to the front of the kayak. So if I needed food or water, I just asked the kayaker. But I could take food or water any time I like, but it was recommended that I tell them in advance, like, I want to be fed every hour, and then they let me know, because that way I get fed more on a consistent basis. Like, instead of having three bigger meals a day, I have lots of little feeding times. There's a beautiful picture of the sunset. Now, this picture was taken just after the sun came up. A good friend of mine named Peter paddled his kayak beside me during the entire night. So this picture was taken just after someone else took over for Peter. Now, what's Peter wearing on his forehead? That's right, it's a headlamp strapped around his forehead so that he can see and have both his hands free for kayak, for paddling the kayak. So there's a picture of me holding a Gatorade bottle and about to take a drink. Now the plan was to start the swim Monday morning and 
finished before dark on Tuesday, because by starting in the morning, I'd swim for two days and one night. If I'd started in the evening, I'd swim for two nights and one day. I'd do, doing a swim as long as 50 kilometers across Lake Ontario, that's difficult enough as it is. It's going to be more difficult swimming at night. So I thought I could be finished before the second nightfall, but I had predicted it would take between 30 and 36 hours to complete the crossing. It took 41 hours to cross, which meant I had to swim into the second night. All through Tuesday, I was looking at this picture of the Toronto shoreline, including the CN Tower, and for at least three hours, the shoreline didn't seem to be getting any closer. One time I asked out loud, does this lake even have an other side? <laughs> Nonetheless, I proceeded with my resolution that I'm going to keep stroking until I reach the other side, regardless of how long it takes. When the second lake came, boom, I suddenly felt sleepy and cold. I'm surprised I didn't feel sleepy sooner because I had been swimming for 35 hours and awake for 38 hours. But given that I was no longer comfortable and not making noticeable progress, I thought, I'm willing to go on, but what's the point? So I said, pull me out. It's taking longer to get there than I thought. I don't know if I can make it. I feel sleepy and I'm starting to get cold. My coach said, you'll be very disappointed if you don't finish. So that was all it took to discourage me from quitting. I did finish the swim eventually. So the Solo Swims of Ontario assigns a swim master to oversee the safety of the swim. My swim master's name was Marilyn, and she's wearing a pink bathing cap, I'm wearing the red. She was wearing a wetsuit, and she was getting cold, and I could, she would not have let me continue to swim into the second night if she wasn't prepared to get in the water with me, because this way she could monitor my condition better. Now, now what's the green thing that's strapped behind Marilyn's clothes? Oh, yes? That's right, it's a glow stick so that she can be seen at that, that night. Now, because I was physically exhausted, I remember almost nothing of the last four hours of the swim, but I do remember that all of a sudden the wall of rocks appeared. I remember hearing someone say, touch the wall. I remember touching the wall, hearing people clapping, then being lifted onto a blanket with five people standing around me and then waking up in the hospital five hours later. So this picture was taken when I was lying on the stretcher being looked at by one of the paramedics. I was in hypothermia, that means your body temperature is low, and I was dehydrated. It's diff maybe difficult to believe that I can be surrounded by water and, and actually be dehydrated. Dehydrated means your body's run out of liquid. So unfortunately, your body doesn't absorb the water unless you actually drink it. And you don't really want to drink the complete water. So this is the picture of myself and Pam, who was, was my swim coach. She was very encouraging. Like, she stayed on the Zodiac for the entire 41 hours. And at the end, when I was getting tired, my legs stop kicking my legs so my leg would, so would drop down and create resistance. It, was like, it would actually take less energy to kick and keep my legs up because of less resistance. Many times, like Hong said, keep your legs up. So I keep them up for, start kicking for a while, but then I, again, I, I <clears throat> want to see that I found it too much energy to kick them, so I just let them drain the table. Pam was very passionate and she wanted me to complete that goal just as badly as I wanted to complete it. I could not have asked for a better coach. And I spent two days in the hospital, and meanwhile, the sense of accomplishment still hadn't sunk in. When you're physically exhausted and you just want to sleep, somehow it doesn't matter what you've just accomplished. Until my parents were driving me home along Highway 401, I looked out the window and said, There's the Ontario. That was the first time that it sunk in that I had actually done it. Okay, for the remainder of the presentation, I'm going to talk about Asperger's syndrome. 
that people with Asperger's syndrome, Asperger's syndrome lies on the autism spectrum, but by definition, people with Asperger's syndrome have average to above average intelligence, then where is the problem lie? Mainly in social situations. Like, I have difficulty understanding what people are thinking based on their facial expression. And difficulty picking up, up social cues. I'm completely capable of learning what's socially acceptable. It just takes me longer than it takes the average person. Another characteristic is a good memory. Like when I was in grade five, I got my hands on a book containing an algorithm for solving a Rubik's cube, and I still remember how to solve it. Uh, that's an overview of Asperger's syndrome. How does Asperger's syndrome affect me personally? I have to be given specific instructions. I don't remember this, but my father tells me I was jumping on the blue couch, and my father said, Jay, stop. I didn't respond because I didn't know stop what. So my father said, Jay, stop jumping on the blue couch. So I stopped. 30 seconds later, I started jumping on the yellow chair. So my father said, Jay, don't jump on any piece of furniture in the living room. I take things literally. Like when I was eight and my sister was 10, my father broke his leg and was in the hospital for two days. Right before my mother left the house to take my sister and me to the hospital, my mother said, if there's no nurse nearby, quietly follow me down the hallway. And my sister asked my mother, what if the nurse comes to him when we're in there? And my mother said, she'll kick you out. I thought my mother meant that the nurse was going to pick up my body and kick it out of the room like a soccer ball. But one of my mentors from my hometown has talked to me a number of times, and he knows that it's common for me to follow what he's saying for a while and then look confused. He knows me well enough to know that most of the time, the reason I'm confused is because I, he said one sentence which I didn't understand the meaning of. I'm so busy trying to figure out the meaning of that one sentence that I disregard everything he says after that. So if he's talking to me and I look confused, he'll back up, figure out which sentence he said confused me, clarify it, and then move on. Again, I don't remember this, but my father tells me that when I was 18 months old, I was working on jigsaw puzzles with remarkable perseverance. My sister, who's two years older than me, would not touch the puzzles. So my father concluded then and there that I was capable of accomplishing anything if I put my mind to it. His biggest concern was that I put my mind to the wrong thing, because he concluded that I could go out a bank if I put my mind to it. Now, I can do well at something, such as swimming across Lake Ontario or working on jigsaw puzzles, but if I really give it my focus, the flip side is I have trouble focusing on more than one thing at a time. Like the first time I had a job away from home, I'd come back to my apartment after a day of work, and as soon as I opened the door, the landlords would ask, how was your day, Jay? And their dog would come racing towards me. I was afraid it was going to jump on me and shred my brand new coat. So as soon as it got too close for comfort, I'd shake one knee at the dog. The dog would turn around and race the other way. The landlord said, Jay, don't shake your knee at the dog. It gets the dog all excited. And the biggest challenge I face day to day is putting my thoughts into words on the spur of the moment. And even if I could have done that, I wouldn't have had the nerve to say, nice try. How can you get the dog excited when it already is excited? I was trying to ward off the dog, answer a question, and take my coat off all at the same time. So when the landlords asked, how was your day, Jay? First of all, that question does not have a specific answer. Second of all, I was in transition. And third of all, I had another distraction to worry about, namely the dog. So if I, when I first walk in the door, especially if I pop my arms full of groceries, that is not the time to ask me questions. Now, when I'm finished speaking, there will be a time for questions. Please do not let anything I say discourage you from asking me questions. Because questions overload me when I'm focused on something and I have to drop my focus to answer the question. But 
I came here for no reason other than to talk to you about Asperger's syndrome, so you won't disrupt my focus on something else. I mentioned earlier that I take things literally, including the question, how are you? It was only a few years ago when I realized that in Canada, more often than not, that question is intended as a greeting and not for its literal meaning. And notice I said, in Canada, because someone told me that in Sweden, people don't ask, how are you, unless they really want to know. So I thought, I want to go to Sweden. <laughs> I prefer people say, hello, instead of, how are you? My solution to, to find it a burden to answer the question, how are you? Here's my solution to avoid the burden. I try to beat the other person to it and say hello before the other person has a chance to say how are you. Because that way, assuming the other person only intended how are you as a greeting and only wanted a greeting in return, then I'm allowed to disregard the question because I've already given the greeting. Now, because this is a recurring problem, I decided to do something about it. I designed a shirt which says on the front, if you ask me, how are you, it will take me 30 minutes to tell you, do you still know to know? On the back it says, points to remember, if you only intend to greet me, you say hello, not how are you. Do not ask how are you unless you really want to know the answer, and you can spare at least 30 minutes to listen to the answer. If I appear to be in a hurry, do not ask me any questions. So one person pointed out, if I am in a hurry, they're probably not going to have enough time to read all the way down to the third point. One, my, teach, my teacher thought that I wasn't physically capable of sitting still. She, and she, I can't say I blame her, she made a written request to the director of the school board that I be taken out of the school board unless I was put on rid of it, but my father objected. So one morning, my father came to the classroom, and when my father was present, I sat still because I knew I'd be in trouble with him if I didn't sit still. I didn't realize it at the time, but my father came to the classroom in order to prove to the teacher that I could sit still. In grade one, I spent a lot of time in the principal's office. In grade two, my regular teacher never sent me to the principal's office. Instead, I had a social worker work with me one-on-one. -on -one. Apparently, the school had concluded that that was more effective. However, my grade two French teacher did send me to the principal's office twice but only twice. So the first time was because I, I pushed the girl sitting next to me. I didn't mean to hurt her. I unintentionally pushed her so hard she fell over her chair. And the second time, because I emptied the shavings from a pencil sharpener into a girl's hair, the same girl. Yeah. In grades one and two, I had a female teacher. In grade three, I had a male teacher. I didn't realize it at the time, but having a male teacher helped me out a lot because I was a lot less likely to resist male authority. So one morning, my teacher said to me, you step out of that seat once between now and dinner time and you're in trouble. He probably meant dinner as in lunch time. I thought he meant supper time as in the end of the day. I thought I had to sit in my chair for the rest of the school day with the understanding that I'm allowed to go home for lunch and I'm allowed to go outside for afternoon recess. So the teacher's reprimand worked better than he thought it would. Uh, I read a book titled Hitchhiking Through Asperger's Syndrome by Lise Piles. She has a son with Asperger's Syndrome. Like me, he 
experienced a lot of teasing and bullying, but a lot of it was due to a lack of understanding back then. So she writes that other students knew how to pick on her son and stay below the teacher's radar. For example, one of my classmates oh, will see a teacher approaching down the hallway in a distance, so he'll gently nudge me, and then I'll hit the other person. I'll get in trouble, but the other person won't because the teacher saw what I did, but didn't see what the other person did to provoke my behavior. She also mentions the common denominator problem. Because Lee's pile son is different, he's the target for teasing and bullying. It's common for him to be bullied by one student on Monday, a different student on Tuesday, and so on. By Friday, he's been bullied by five different people. True, he's the common denominator of the problem, but that doesn't mean he's the cause of the problem. Now, as I mentioned earlier, they People with Asperger's syndrome are smart, like, but smart intellectually. But what they don't know is something called theory of mind. They don't know what the other person does or doesn't know. Now, and ask you, for those of you who don't know, it's a slang term meaning a person with Asperger's syndrome. If you show an ASCII a video of two people, let's call them Sally and Anne, so, Sally sees Anne put the key underneath the cell phone, and Sally leaves the room, and while Sally is, is gone, Anne takes the key out from under the cell phone and puts it inside the box. When Sally comes back, where is Sally going to look for the key? The Aspie will say, in the box, therefore that's where Sally's going to look for it. But the ASCII doesn't know that Sally doesn't know the key has been moved. So he asks the ASCII, where is Sally going to expect to find the key? Like similarly, people could, could bully me, they could pick, pick fights with me and get away with it because the the other student would hit me and I couldn't wait to get them back. I hit them back right in front of the teacher and then it didn't matter if I told the teacher he hit me first. The other student hit me first, but the teacher didn't know that the other student hit me first. I didn't know that the teacher didn't know that the other student hit me first. And the student knew that the teacher didn't know that I didn't know that the other student hit me first. Then, Expecting the world to treat you fairly because you are good is like expecting the bull not to charge at you because you are a vegetarian. Now, now no two people with Asperger's syndrome are alike. If you've seen one Aspie, you've seen one Aspie. But another reason people could bully me and get away with it is that I'm face blind. I have trouble recognizing faces. So that meant it was difficult for I can tell the teacher that someone hit me, but it was difficult for me to tell the teacher who did it. Now, if one person keeps beating you up, the first solution you're going to resort to is probably stay away from that person. But so many people would pick on me because I'm different, so I couldn't stay away from them all. And, and you and you think that the obvious solution is to go where no one can see you, but unfortunately, you're even more likely to be bullied because people, uh, people are less likely to bully you if there's witnesses around. So my, my advice to those who are being bullied is go ideally be somewhere where the teacher can see you, and if, if that's not possible, be, um, go somewhere where there's lots of people around because people are less likely to bully you if there's witnesses. It was difficult for me to distinguish between traveling and reporting a bullying incident. And uh, there's a long list of ways that people can bully. 
they, they don't have, it doesn't have to be physical violence. So, like, <clears throat> one example is excluding. Like at my school, we almost always played kickball at recess. I was usually the last person to pick and twice, but only twice, fortunately. Like, the people, one team says, okay, Jay's on your team. Like, we don't want him. Well, we don't want him. Well, I guess he's not playing. And, yeah. Okay, this is a picture of what? Any guesses? That's right, it's, it's a park bench. Yeah. In my last year, before I started high school, I played on a softball team. And, and one day, the bench that my team was sitting on, and one of the supports was broken. So, several people, and on my team, including myself, took thrill of jumping on that one end. And if you jump on the one end, what do you think is going to happen on the other end? It's going to go up. We're, we're using it as a teeter totter. So, what do you think is going to happen to the person on the other end? They're, they're going to go flying. Now, do you think the bench was designed to withstand that kind of stream? No, it wasn't. So if you jump on the bench enough times and make, it, and make the other person go flying, well, what do you think is going to happen to the bench eventually? Yeah, that's right, it's going to break. Eventually, the middle support broke, and, and even though the whole team was jumping on it, the coaches were, were accusing me as if I was the only one responsible. It's, told me I was going to have to pay for a new bench. But that was May or June, and nothing was said until the following September, two weeks after I started high school, I received a phone call saying, this is the town of Deep River calling about the bench that you broke last spring. It will cost $150 for a new bench. Do you have some of money like that? I said the whole team was jumping on it. And the coaches said it was you. And do you want to pay your share and have the rest of the team pay their share? I said, in the first place, it was only put together with nails. If I had the broken pieces, I could fix it. And the other person said, okay, I'll leave the shed open for you and you can fix it. So I was all set to go home for lunch, get a hammer and some nails, and go straight to the park after school and try to fix the bench. But anyway, so, someone said to my sister, Ask Jay about the broken bench, and Claire said, why? So Claire told him, or the other person told Claire the whole story. And, and like, it wasn't the town of Deep River that had called me. It was one of the coaches posing as the town of Deep River. And by the way, these were not adult coaches. They were upper year high school students. So, so well, Claire made it clear to me that I didn't have to do anything. Like, I was told that eventually that the broken pieces had been taken to the dump and the town didn't even know about it. So, but there were three or four people, like, like when, I, when they saw me, they often asked, hey, Jay, have you paid for the boat and paid for the park bench yet? One time, someone asked me that when Claire was around, and Claire said, leave them alone now. So, thank goodness for big sisters. Now, I haven't always been as physically active as I am now. The first turning point was grade 8 when I joined the cross country running team. I wasn't the best, I wasn't out to break any records, but joining the cross country running team did two things for me. It gave me an opportunity to demonstrate my perseverance and it gave me a place in society. And then when I was in grade 11, I joined the cross country ski team. Now the best way to learn something, for example, social etiquette, is by example. So, like I'm capable of learning what's socially acceptable, but it would take me longer than the average person. A lot of my classmates and teachers would, would give up on me because they concluded it would teach me social etiquette was more hassle than it's worth. And, but having a place in society as a from being physically active, perhaps that's what caused people to welcome me into their circle of friends long enough for me to learn by example what's socially acceptable. So if I could only give one piece of advice to someone with Asperger's syndrome, 
It would be get good at something. In my case, it was physical activity. In someone else's case, it was music. But it's not going to give you the results you need quickly. It'll take time. Now, now there's, there's very few hard and fast rules about who's your friend and, and who's only trying to take advantage of you. Some people might be friendly and with the intention of taking advantage of winning, winning my trust and then taking advantage of it. There's also people who don't understand me at first, but once they get to know me, they become my friend. My best friend in grade school, his name was Derek. Two separate times, Derek and I were out for a walk. Someone saw me at the distance and said, Jay Sarnula. Derek looked straight at the person and said, Have you got a problem, kid? So Derek was clearly my true friend. However, twice Derek said to me, I'm never speaking to you again. But that only lasted two days. Now, that was grade seven. At that age, two days seems like a long time without your best friend speaking to you. So looking back, I suspect that either Derek still, still wanted to be my friend, but he needed time away from me to recharge his batteries, or I had to make the mistake of assuming that Derek's my true friend, therefore I can do anything I want, and it's not going to tick him off. So, so Lise Piles, in her, in her book, she writes, What is a friend? Do they give things to you? Share with you? Do they take turns with you? Offer to help you? Walk with you? What is not a friend? Do they make fun of you? Hurt you? Do they try to make you do bad things? Do they take things from you? Okay, now I'm going to talk about school from an academic perspective. Now, I was good at the top of the class in math, but not so good at reading comprehension. In grade one, I was in the top group of three reading groups, but that's when we had to be able to read a passage, which I could do. I could pronounce all the words, but I'd read in a monotone voice and wouldn't put in any expression. I really started to struggle in grade three when we were expected to comprehend because I had trouble reading between the lines and picking up hidden meanings or because I take things literally, I have trouble with idioms, including the expression read between the lines. So near the end, as in the top group of of three reading groups in grade three, but near the end of the school year, my teacher said to me, next year you'll either be in the middle group or the low group. You'll never make it into the top group. So, uh, in grade seven was when social studies separates to history and geography, and then history was my weakest subject. So I had to take a course in grade 10 Canadian history, and I almost failed. Like looking back, the school curriculum clearly wasn't designed for people with Asperger's syndrome, so I'm glad that they now have the IEP, Individualized Education Plan. And unfortunately for me, it didn't exist when I was courage. Um, I believe that any relationship can work if both parties are willing to make small but significant changes. The key is knowing which changes are small changes are significant. And because I'm, I'm slow at processing information, so often I find myself caught trying to listen what the, what the teacher is saying when he's writing on board three, and I'm still trying to copy on board one. So, so I try not to get lapped, but it wasn't until my last year of university that I would explain my situation to the teacher how and it helps a lot if the teacher would erase only one word at a time and erase them in order. That way I know I'm, when I'm about to get lapped and, and then I can pick up speed. If the teacher was about to erase a word out of turn, which I hadn't yet copied, I'd say, don't erase that word. So I'm going to conclude with some advice on dealing with an ASPE. The, the first way, I, you've got to be firm with them. It may, it may take two or three tries, but you may have to repeat the instructions. Be careful asking questions which don't have a specific answer, such as, how are you, how is work, or how is your day at school? Be careful when issuing orders, like, such as, 
Sometimes you have to, like the blue couch, yellow chair story. But if I'm given too many orders, I can't follow them all. And sometimes I don't want to talk and want to be left alone. So if I get one or two word answers to questions, that could be a sign that I'm trouble. Uh, that I don't want to be disturbed at that time. Um, it takes time to build a relationship with anyone, more so for people with Asperger's syndrome. So, and lastly, I should need to say that if you would accuse the Aspie of doing something which he didn't do, then you can destroy the trust that you spent a long time building. My last piece of advice is there is no quick fix solution. There's nothing you can do that I'm sure the problem won't happen again. Now, because I'm physically active, I have a big appetite that I love to date. My favorite recipe is this oatmeal and raisin scones, no sugar added. Those of you who bake probably know that you can figure out easily that I use a rolling pin to roll them up on the counter, cut them into squares, and then put them on the cookie sheet. Many times my father has asked, has asked me, how many scones did you bake? And that question overloads me because I don't know the answer and I feel like he's pressuring me to get an answer. So I wrote him a letter, explained that I found that question overloading and said, now I'm going to ask you some questions. Why does the exact number of scones matter? How badly do you want to know the answer to that question? Are you aware that how large or small a cup of scones affects how many scones there are, but does not affect the total overall mass or volume of the scones? Do you expect me to count them? If so, do you expect me to do so before we're finished baking? If so, do you expect me to take them out of the oven while I count them, or leave the oven door open and stick my head in and risk burning myself while I count them? Okay, I'm going to conclude with a joke. Okay? A U.S. ship was traveling through the ocean when it received a message saying, you're on a collision course, please divert your course 15 degrees to the south. The Americans replied, recommended you divert your course 15 degrees to the north. The Canadians said, negative, you will have to divert your course. And the Americans said, this is the aircraft carrier's USS Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States fleet. We are accompanied by three destroyers and numerous support vessels. I demand you change your course or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of this ship. And the Canadians replied, this is a lighthouse, your call. <laughs> okay. Now after doing the swim, I wrote a book which talks about my swim across Lake Ontario, how I trained for it, and my life with Asperger's syndrome. So the library of your school is about to own a copy, so if you want to read more, just check your local library. Check your school library in a few days. Any questions? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Jay. <laughs> and feel free to, Jay Simmons had some pretty good questions uh, to ask Jay, and feel free to ask now. But before you do, I just want to add a special note of significance. So Jay has been he's an accomplished athlete, accomplished academic. Uh, he's a champion for people that sometimes are misunderstood. So that's really important as a community. Uh, that we want to uh, be exemplary citizens. We want to understand our community better. Uh, Jay can help us out with that because he has a great lens on how we look at things so refreshingly. And also, uh, a side note, Jay and I went to school together. We've known each other since probably five or six years old. And Jay has been in touch with me every now and then, even though he lives in Ontario, and he comes out to Alberta to visit his older sister. But he's come out to Alberta to do something very specific. Uh, how many of you know what the death race is? You heard the death race? Okay. <laughs> so the, the death race is a 125 kilometer running race in Grand Cash. Yes. Okay. And uh, it's such a big race uh, that they have to have a training session to make sure you can get through it. And it's happening in a few weeks, is that right? Yes. All right, so they get three days to kind of do the distance to see what it's like uh, before they do it in one shot. So how long does it typically take to do that race? Well, there's a time limit of 24 hours that 
the record, I think, is 12 or 13 hours. So, so I need presumption. I don't think I'm going to complete it in less than 20 hours. So my goal is just to complete a period and then complete it under 24 hours. But other than that, the faster I can complete it, the better. Excellent. All right, we'll to the floor for a few questions before we head off to lunch. And from the parents, too, you're welcome to ask questions. Uh, do you find that having Asperger's affects uh, the quality of your work in the workplace and affects social relationships uh, in the workplace? Well, did, did you all hear the question? Yeah. Yeah, because, well, yes, it does affect the quality of my work because I work the world, but when I'm given several, when I'm given several tasks, a, a task at once, it's difficult for me to focus on one specific task, but, but when I first finished university, I didn't know I had Asperger's syndrome, and even after I found out, I was hesitant to tell people, and then now, when I I almost always tell my employer that, and so when I explain the problem, like which, if I have two or more tasks, then I can say I, I can't focus on the moment. What should I do first? And then the social aspects, and I know most of my coworkers know that, that it overloads me this, when they ask, how are you? But it's not the question per se that overloads me, it's the pressure to respond, to reply. So if the other person is okay with me not answering the question, and I know the other person is okay with it, then it won't go for the movie. Okay, yes. Would you give any advice to a young person that has social challenges now? Do I have any advice for a person who has social challenges? Like, say, a kid that's maybe this age or younger, would you give them any advice to sort of be able to do I have any advice? For the, I think she was no harm or fast rules, but anyway, when I was your age, I, I preferred to be alone just because I didn't understand the rules of interaction. And then one question, I, I know one parent has asked, I'm okay if leaving, leaving things as they are if my child is happy, but is he happy? Because the parent didn't know whether he wanted to be with other people and just didn't get understand the rules of engagement. But, even if the child thinks he's happy, it, it will do him well to for, force it against his will to interact with others, but in moderation. So, well, actually, this is an example. Like, when I was nine years old, and then when my grandmother died, all my cousins got together for my grandmother's funeral, and then I pulled up a, a game of full house. Like, it's a four a game that up to four people can play, so I. Played it, I was beating all four players by myself, and then my cousin, who's my age, came up to me and said, I'll be the two losing guys. And I found out later, my mother had told him to, to play everything, but for my own benefit, she wanted me to spend time with one of my cousins instead of by myself. So, does, so it takes, because they generally, like, at least this is the way I was, and most people with Asperger's and they learn what's socially acceptable at a later age than most people. And it was basically my parents, well, as I said, joining the cross country running team in grade 8 did two things for me, but it was basically my parents forced me to go in. I wouldn't have gone in on my own. So you, you don't want to be too forceful that they're uncomfortable, that you need to get them out of their comfort zone. Does that answer your question? Do you enjoy being social now, or is it still challenging? Oh, oh yes, now I enjoy being social. It was around my, my sister's an extrovert, and I'm an introvert, so in August, like every year, they held a triathlon in my hometown, so Claire would always bring lots of people home, and after, the night after the triathlon, like there was a street dance until about one o'clock in the morning. Anyway, my dad told my dad knows that I don't drink, so he told me to go with Claire and her friends to be a designated driver. So I did. But a day or two later, he explained to me that 
He only told him he had designated driver just as a pretext, like by pretexting. I mean, that wasn't the real reason. He wanted me to socialize with him. But if he said, Jay, I order you go and socialize, I, I'd feel like I was being ordered. Whereas if I'm asked to be a designated driver, then I feel like I'm serving a purpose. But two years later, then I was going. Then I wanted to go. And, and while I keep I'm answering questions, can I, can I have a volunteer to mix up the Rubik's Cube? And that's... Well, actually, and this, is a, this is actually a common question. When I got diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, did it change my life, and if so, how? Now, at first, it didn't change my life at all for two reasons. One, I was already pretty sure that's what I had. It was more of a gradual finding, and it wasn't sudden. And coming, the second reason is I was afraid to tell people, because I was afraid that they they think less of me. How many of you have seen the movie Rainy Man? So, not many of the students have seen it, but it's about someone who's autistic, and if you see, and I did not, I thought I do not want to be labeled like that person, and anything you see in the movie, if and when you see the movie, I think you'll understand why I didn't want to be called autistic. So, and even in the best case scenario, even I tell people I have Asperger's syndrome, back then not very many people knew about it, so I'd have to tell them. I'd have to tell them about it. Now, do I have a volunteer to try and how long it's going to take? I have a couple here. Two, well, four timers, I want that. Okay, and I'm not going to look at it until you say go, but while I'm solving it, keep asking questions. Hopefully, you can hear me without the mic. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to start the gym. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, right now. Um, but they keep, they keep asking questions. Got a question here. So, where do you work? Well, actually, right now I'm between jobs. That's an expression for unemployed. Like if, well, listen, it's not having a Yeah, my last job was, was working for, was working near Toronto, like doing quality assurance. That's looking for errors in software. Like, I, know, I imagine all of you have turned on a computer at some time or you play a video game or you just look up information on the internet. But there's. But, if, if, if there's an error, then you're less likely to, to go back to that place. So because I have Asperger's syndrome, I'm, I'm slower at reading something, but if, it, if there's an error, it tends to leap out at me. So, and it was very difficult for the company to put, to put a price on the work I was doing. Because, because if I hadn't been there, if I hadn't found the error, the customer may stop buying the product, which would cost the company money. Any more questions? Sure. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, do you like uh, have like a uh, big spine set up or something? Or do you like or like do I like do activities like a huge sport to give you like fear of like being obvious, like a huge sport is not like that good at all? Do you like trying to Oh, so the question is, do I get involved in activities from you? Ah, like, do you, is there like a fear of joining like a team sports? No, well, actually, was there, the question was, was there a fear of joining team sports? Because, what, what I was in, when I was your age, yes. Now, no, because now, yes, right. Right now, I'm old enough to know that yes, something, might, yes, something might go wrong if I join, if I if I join the sports team, but 
this, the worst that can happen is like not that bad if you get over it. So, so I guess when I was when I was your age, I was afraid of the unknown. Whereas now, like when I moved first moved to Kingston, Ontario, I I joined their running club, I joined the chess club, and so. The, so I thought before I knew it, I had, within a month, I had so many friends, I never would have been out of the finished.